I like the story about the daft boy who was a superb meditator, but can you see any benefits of intelligence to make the smart ones here feel better and prevent lobotomies? <laughs> no, I can't. Look, uh, in that book, The Opening of the Door of Your Heart, there was a poem in there which I got, it's from Sung po, Sung po a very famous Chinese poet. And if I remember it as best I can, it was called On the Birth of My Son. That was the, the title. And it went something like this. On the, birth of the, on the birth of a son, most parents want them to grow up intelligent. But I hope my son turns out stupid. Because I, through intelligence, have wrecked my whole life. If my son is stupid, then you'll have a very tranquil life and complete his peaceful existence by becoming a cabinet minister. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where most stupid people end up, it seems. <laughs> but it was a very beautiful, because sometimes intelligence, you know, we, we praise intelligence, but sometimes it drives people crazy, because intelligence is not wisdom. Intelligence means you're a very powerful thinker, but you don't see the truth of anything. That's why sometimes intelligence, the way that we... Look, uh, I had a big degree from a great university and then went over to Thailand and met someone like an Ajahn Shah four years at school. And after a week staying with that monk, it was very clear to me who was intelligent, who was stupid. I was a stupid one and I thought, what is going on? All that hard work at school, at university, and I was nowhere near as intelligent as a fellow just done four years at school. That really made me doubt you know, our system of education. Yeah, it teaches us to know a lot of things, but to understand very little. It's trouble with education. You know, we, we just, it's old people's knowledge. We're told what to believe. And very rarely are we asked to challenge anything and to inquire. And you know, that's the way to be wise, to ask questions, in ch challenge, challenge yourself as well, ask the questions, see differently. I often say that you know, monks and bhikkhunis, we can think out of the box, because we live out of the box. You know, we're not in the normal way of living. Sometimes it's very hard being a monk, because, you know, for example, sometimes you know, to do something you need proof of identity. And proof of identity means, you know, can we see your social security card? Don't have one. Your marriage license? Don't have that. Driving license? No. Bank account details? No. Credit card? No. So as a monk in many systems, same in the US I'd imagine, but certainly in Australia, you don't exist. You're off the record. I haven't got a tax file number. Because I don't earn any money, so you don't have a tax file number. So <coughs> in many, many ways, you're just off the radar of the government, you don't exist. Which is you know, very great until sometimes you have to prove evidence that you are who you are. You know what I did once? I was checking in at the airport and you know, it was a domestic flight, so I didn't have enough um, ID. So they said, we can't let you on the flight. But you know what I had? I had a copy of my book. And I had a photo of me, I said, look, see, this is my book, this is me, see. <laughs> And that, that got me on the flight, because it's photo ID. And I was very fortunate, I was just carrying a couple of copies to give away. <laughs> so that, sometimes that's what actually happens. So, a lot of times it's nice just being simple. Because all intelligence does, it just thinks old thoughts, carries on in old ways. And you really have to think something different. Look, this is a, a deep simile. Like becoming enlightened. You know that people strive for years, you know, trying to get enlightened. But what it truly is, is like crossing the stream. That's how the Buddha used to describe it, crossing the stream. And it's not a very wide stream, you can actually step over it. The trouble is we always go in the same direction, going upstream or downstream, upstream or downstream. We never actually learn how to go in this other direction, just to cross. And that crossing is just letting go. 
but we don't know how to let go. We're always trying. You tell people to let go and they try to let go. Come on, let go. Come on, I'm going to let go now. I really am going to let go. That's not letting go, that's doing more things. It's still going in the same direction, doing more of the same. And that's the reason why people don't get any anywhere in their meditation. It's just more of the same, more of the same, more of the same. More desire, more craving, attaining more things, doing more things. And the opposite direction is very radical. Sit here and doing absolutely nothing. I'll fall asleep, I'll go restless, it'll get even worse. <coughs> Do it differently. Not more of the same. Not just the way you live your life. Struggle, strive, make it work, make it happen. This is not a personal attainment. It's where you, your ego, vanishes and disappears. You're not there anymore. And that means that you have to totally let go of this will, this doing. And be still and see things disappear. It's a different direction. And that's why you have to you know, live out of the box, think out of the box, do out of the box. And your intelligence has actually got you into a one-track mind. Are you doing things in a certain way? And to get that enlightenment, you have to put all that aside, let it totally go, and do something radical and different. Not to think like other people, not to imitate anybody, not even Ajahn Brahm. If you try and do it my way, no, it's just more doing. Totally let go, abandon everything, vanish. That's how enlightenment happens. You feel like you've been going up the stream, down the stream, never getting across. You just turn around in a direction you've never gone before, perpendicular, you just step over. It's as simple as that. You realize that's letting go. You're disappearing. No more ego, no more me. Is it okay to make a few notes of the talks?